And um, I'm very happy to um, say hello to Anja Kronenberg and Jeppe Ulvi, two editors of these two fashion magazines, Vestoy and Viscose. Um, we um, are sitting in the exhibition Liminal Objects, Critical Contemporary Fashion by the Danish curator Anne Lunge Jorlin. And today we're going to talk about this um, critical fashion. This is what the exhibition is about. It's about how do we, how does um, um, fashion, how can creativity stay in fashion? Is it, does it have to be unlinked to a commercial interest? A lot of the, uh, there's eight, ex eight, eight artists, fashion designers here, who all have worked with big fashion houses, but the things that they're exhibiting today is their own works um, with a lot of less funding. Uh, one theme that is going through as a red thread is in all of this is scarcity. When you don't have the fundings and you don't have the materials, is that is it a cliche or is it true that that, that brings an another different um, sort of creativity which might be similar to what you're doing in your um, non-commercial fashion magazines. Um, Anja Kronberg is an um, art historian, a historian of design, and editor of Vestoy, this magazine. And Jebe is also art historian, curator of art exhibition, and right now doing a PhD in Santa Cruz, um, and the editor of Visco's magazine. So I would like to ask both of you, and then from there you, c you can start the discussion, why did you start these magazines and did the world actually need another fashion magazine? That's not really fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I don't know really if that's the uh, right question to ask, honestly. I mean, I'm not sure that it... Uh, that creativity really relies on whether we need another X, Y, Z um, or not. I, uh, I, I suppose the kind of publishing that uh, Jeppe and I both do probably relies, or I would say relies a lot on um, self-expression, really. Like, the is there a need for another it has more to do with is there a place for what I want to say in the world that, uh, or in the discipline that I work in? And um, speaking only for myself, uh, um, then on to you. But uh, I would say that <coughs> when I started Vestoy about 14 or so years ago, um, I thought that there wasn't uh, a strong enough space for writing about fashion and and that's what i that was the does does the world need another yes certainly needs another magazine with writing about fashion because fashion is such a visually led um field as you know and there's so much um emphasis that's put on images and the text um in my opinion at least is often a, a kind of afterthought and so with vestoy i wanted to um create a space for all different kinds of writing about fashion, prose, criticism, oral histories, um, and research. I mean, I had noticed, I come from um, fashion academia, and I had noticed how um, there's um, a reasonably well-developed uh, area of, um, of academics that uh, study fashion, and of course the industry is huge, but the twain don't seem to meet. Um, and so, I, uh, I mean, with academia, that my impression was very much that academics speak to other academics. There's a well-developed jargon, and the point isn't really, uh, I mean, what you get points for, let's say, as an academic, what you get, um, um, yeah, I mean, points within your institution, how the institution gets money is, that you perform um, as an academic, you publish academic papers, you um, you speak at academic conferences, but the outlet um, 
to reach outside of academia is very limited. And so a lot of people who work in the fashion industry who have uh, a, a desire and, and a need to think more critically about fashion don't necessarily know where to find that information. And so Vestoy is an attempt to cross those two worlds, academia and industry. What about Viscos? Thank you, Anya, and thank you for inviting us. Um, I would say the short version is um, the same what Anya just said just 10 years later. <laughs> um, and the longer story is, I think fashion needs magazines like these because um, as Anya refers to as well, as fashion is incredibly meaningful and is incredibly ubiquitous in, in all of society. But the media outlets for fashion is, are very visually led. Um, there is a history of fashion writing, of course, but it's it's murky and and um, hard to kind of historically place. But certainly in the last um, 40 or so years, the magazines that we have had and have grown up with and now have that have led into the digital era are often historically founded or led by photographers or stylists. And not that there's anything wrong with them. <laughs> um, but fashion is also um, something that has to be written about and, and can be expressed through words. And, um, and lots of people drift to fashion writing. They gravitate to it and, and, um, and need analytical, critical language to, um, to unpack what fashion means and is and isn't. And I think there is a need. I think every generation has a magazine that does that. Um, I grew up in when I was in university reading Vestoy, and that was like my Bible. And um, uh, and because I think there was, it was a space to deal with fashion intellectually, um, which a lot of especially students are very invested in. It's a time before you meet industry, before you meet the pressures of commerce, which in fashion is so intense that um, having a kind of an autonomous space or a relatively autonomous space where you can dive deep into nerdy topics, um, I think fashion needs that and I think we need that. And I certainly felt like I needed that. I, um, I have a relationship to academia as well, but I more so have a relationship to the art, um, art publishing. I'm an art critic. And um, I think I identified a similar thing that in one end you have the sort of insular world of peer review fashion journals that very much serve their own kind of points based system. There's very little connection to fashion industries. And then on the other end you have art. Um, that actually does have a very um, kind of relatively large industry of critical writing in a commercial sense, art magazines, mm -hmm. where um, kind of critical analytical language is what drives these magazines, at least historically. And a lot of art critics are really interested in fashion, but never get to write about it. And I was really interested in, I think when I was coming up as a, I've always dreamt to be a fashion journalist and when I finally started writing fashion journalism, I, it really broke my heart um, to realize what the industry was or what the job was. It was How would you describe it, though? <laughs> I was just telling you. Um, I think we all have a dream, or I had a dream that you know I could be work for like Vogue and and do these like profound um, interviews or write really long pieces about important fashion things whatever I chose and on and on whatever topic. And I think historically there was more space and freedom for fashion magazines, especially independent fashion magazines, who of course had advertisers but could deal with them at a bit of a remove. Um, but I think I came, I started writing professionally at a time when the death of print was happening, this thing we were all talking about, that mag print magazine culture was dying. Um, everything was drifting to online um, platforms, clickbait, um, and fashion, corporate luxury fashion was also growing more and more every year, LVMH, caring, whatever. Um, I was working for magazines that I think when they started around 2000, 2001, 
they had, um, this is a real example, they had Karl Lagerfeld on the cover. And because they, in, for the first issue, they called him up, they found his phone number and interviewed him about his cat. And it was a really fun conversation and kind of rock and roll. You can't do that in 2016. There you have, you beg these fashion brands to give you an interview with the creative director. And if they, and you're kind of in line with all the other advertisers who also want to cover uh, luxury fashion. And increasingly I saw this sort of power dynamics change where, is a, where now like a Gucci or a, a, a Chanel or whoever's paying for advertising, they actually decide when they want to be featured and what they'll give the magazines. And often it's okay, you can't talk to Karl Lagerfeld, but you can talk to our head of makeup because we have this lipstick that we just released and we already asked the questions and we already have the answers and there's 10 questions and 10 answers. Um, you can choose three of them because the other seven are going to other regions in other markets. That's journalism and in, in that space. And that when I realized that it was sort of a conspiracy almost, I was like, this I need to get out of here. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was glorified PR. And there's nothing wrong with PR, but it's, it's not the end of fashion writing. So um, I think, yeah, similarly, some, some, I saw some bridges, but also I had to do something else with all my fashion interests but when I realized that I was not going to spend my life in fashion, commercial fashion publishing, which actually had been the plan for, for a very long time. <laughs> so I had to, had to turn things around, yeah. How long did it take for your heart to break? Not long, honestly. I mean, I think I see there are a lot of some students here, and I'm really happy there 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 are because fashion school is in one of those. It's a really incredible space because everyone is so open and critical and creative, and um, haven't met the industry yet. Really, um, often someone a curator once told me that the best artwork an artist does is often their last, but the best f collection a fashion designer does is their first, because it's their graduate collection before they get a job in a corporation. <laughs> and I think um, similarly, when I was in fashion school at Central St. Martin's, I dreamt really big and I was reading art theory about conceptual art, but I was trying to apply those ideas to like fashion history. Could uh, fashion practice only be through exhibitions? Could it be completely outside of commercial corporate systems, could it be activist, could it be political? And um, the first commercial fashion jobs I had in media, I tried to cover those things. And there was space for that to some extent. But at the end of the day, to make the wheels go around in these businesses, you know, you have to cover the lipstick. You have to write about the lipstick. And um, so yeah, only a couple of years actually. <laughs> There is a cult of product and promotion in fashion media, but there's also a cult of personality. And I think that was the other thing that I really resisted, that I wasn't in this business to um, to glorify creative directors of, of, of fashion brands more. And um, I think there are so many other things in fashion that are interesting. And I don't think necessarily creative directors, as we know them today, have very much interesting to say or are allowed to say very much interesting. So I was, Viscos was an attempt to talk about the behind the scenes, the production manufacturing, to talk about the fashion that appears on the street, style, dress. I mean, in many ways, you know, following the tradition of Vestoy as, as kind of insisting on writing about the social space of clothes, but also to talk about the industry at the same time. Because most fashion magazines they only talk about industry and from a particular point of view. I don't know if you, did you improvise that when you developed Vestoy over all these years or was there a kind of a from the get go, a kind of methodology in the way that you commissioned topics in and outside of? Well, I think um, for me, um, Every issue of a story, the story comes out once a year uh, in this uh, paper form. And um, for me, every issue has been uh, an opportunity to really 
fall into this rabbit hole of uh, a particular topic. So every issue of a story deals with a very specific topic. The, I try to choose topics that on the surface um, seem as if they don't have all that much to do with fashion. But then when you really get into it, you can see all these crazy connections that you weren't aware of before. So the one here on the table is uh, on everyday life. Earlier ones have been on doubt or failure. Um, there was one... Masculinity. Authenticity was another one. Speed. Shame. It was Speed or time? Slowness? S slowness. slowness. Um, so it's kind of these <coughs> big, idea, big ideas type topics. And then uh, in the actual issue, I look at, I, I use, as I was mentioning earlier, um, all from prose, uh, interviews, oral history, um, uh, personal personal essays, uh, criticism. So all these different um, routes to navigate into um, this topic that, that we're looking at. And so in many ways, Vestoy has been a very self-indulgent project because it's allowed me to really um, dedicate time to learning, to research, to uh, to read and think myself and to give the people that I've been working with also the space to do the same. Um, I also, when I first started, um, felt uh, very much the need to position Vestoy against what, what um, I didn't like in commercial fashion publishing, along the same lines of what Jeppe was saying. But over the years, I, uh, I'm, I've uh, become uh, way less angry and uh, way more um, empathetic, probably, understanding. Like, you know, it's not an us against them kind of thing, niche against mainstream, uh, good against bad, or anything like that. But, but rather, you know, you go through life, you have different needs at different times, and you try to, uh, you know, to the best of your abilities, find a space or carve out a space for uh, for yourself. I mean, I think these projects, they are, because they are, in, in a sense, creative or artistic projects, certainly more than they are commercial endeavors. So in, uh, in certain ways, I mean, I, I think um, all niche projects, I think, Rebecca, you were alluding to that earlier with the designers in this room as well. You know, you have to find a way to interact with the industry, to do your uh, commercial work, and also at the same time to do your personal work. And for me, that route has, you know, I've also tried to navigate that, uh, that space, which is interesting because it also, I mean, when I started Vestoy, I was very, um, uh, <laughs> how do you say, like, uh, and I, uh, I, was, I thought of myself very much as a kind of um, a rebel or a renegade, and I was very much um, uh, down on my friends who worked in commercial fashion, and I saw myself very much uh, in opposition to that. And, you know, me, independent, them, um, and, you know, writing about the Chanel lipsticks or, you know. <laughs> um, but I don't really think like that anymore because I have come to understand that and that uh, <laughs> work and life is just a lot more um, gray, gray, right, than, uh, than what I thought in my 20s. <laughs> um, in the sense that, you know, whether you, uh, you know, f for my work with Vestoy, I don't, Vestoy doesn't rely on advertising. That was very important from the start. It was a kind of um, stance that I took against this commercial um, aspect of the fashion industry. But that, of course, doesn't make you independent as such. It just creates another way of, of dealing with the same, um, uh, with the same problematics that everyone who works in fashion has to deal with to a lesser or greater extent. You know, how do you um, work in a space that, that has certain rules that you can only break away from so much or that uh, perhaps, you know, in, in, in my case, I've been able to forge a space where I don't need to ask, um, 
I don't know, a Karl Lagerfeld about the, the, or the makeup person at Chanel about the perfume or whatever it was, <laughs> that where I can ask that same person uh, or a creative director at the company um, questions that don't have, that are not uh, connected to the latest um, product release, but that are connected to the theme that we're exploring with Vistoy. And so, those, but those relationships, they have to be honed over time. And you don't make friends with people by critici criticizing them all the time. So you gotta, you know, you have to find a way to, I have had to find a way to, um, to retain my, uh, that um, um, contrarian attitude that comes very natural to me, but at the same time, <laughs> do that without alienating people, you know, which you don't wanna do in work, uh, friendship or life in general. <laughs> um, but you know, it's funny because uh, a lot, oftentimes, like, and I've I've talked about Vestoy uh, many many times over the years uh, in t in uh, groups of students, sometimes sometimes in uh, in contexts like this one. And um, one thing that I always think is quite funny is that we focus so much on the um, creative. Uh, aspects of magazine making, you know, what what are your inspirations? I, I often get asked, uh, you know, where I don't know where did the name come from or whatever. Like a lot of a lot of questions that focus that focus on the making of. I never get questions about like how do you make it happen? Like where does the money come from? You know, <laughs> do you pay the people you work with? Do you earn anything yourself? And I think it's 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 interesting that um, also when it comes to uh, independent projects, uh, so many people in the fashion industry are trying to figure out how to create that balance, you know, how to uh, have one foot in, in the world that you create yourself and that you love, but then also be able to make that commercially viable. Actually, we focus so very, it's still seen uh, maybe as a, a bit gauche to ask, you know, <laughs> are you rich? Like, <laughs> is that how you make this happen? <laughs> I'm not rich, but, um, but I, but I think it's quite interesting the the ways that you can make it happen, and I think maybe we should talk a little yeah, bit about that. Totally, you know, like the the nuts and bolts of magazine making or of niche production, niche mm -hmm. cultural pr uh, production. Yeah, no, I was sitting on on the Vesto, uh, Ves Visco's idea for years without doing anything about it because I didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, I was kind of sniffing around and, and seeking out models. And it was, I mentioned this, the death of print, which obviously didn't quite happen. Print still lives. And the all these, I mean, ID just two weeks ago, who were some of the first to rush onto digital publishing and clickbait kind of um, economics of advertising, they just shut down their online platform and um, the entire archive is gone. I wrote for them for years <laughs> because they have a new owner who said, oh, this is not a business model anymore. So that's gone. Um, and they're now on, you know, TikTok, Instagram. That's very long captions is where the money is at now. Other people seek drift to newsletters. And anyway, so I was, I was looking around and I remember I was very interested in how the white review which has just closed as well, actually. Rest in peace. White Review had a partnership with Aesop that more or less covered their production budget, and 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 the sort of the payoff was that they would be available in every single Aesop store as a part of a lifestyle brand. So you go and buy your nice soaps in this sort of very designed space, and a part of the story of that lifestyle is that you have kind of literary criticism in your bathroom, maybe, or in your living room. And I thought, oh, that's toilet a nice... Toilet reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good toilet reading. So I thought, oh, that's like Something a nice dense. model. Like, I, I'm happy to be a part of a lifestyle narrative. Like, um, so I was talking to PR people and, like, market. I was like, could you connect us to this brand and this brand? And, like, I mean, I don't necessarily think I was knew I what I was doing, but the amounts... Because we too are advertising free, and it was somewhat of a stance, but by no means like a political one. If a brand had come with money at one point, which they never have, <laughs> and trust me, I've tried, um, the amount of PDFs I've made over the time, over the years, um, it's kind of devastating actually. <laughs> but I was trying at different things, and it didn't really work. And 
then there's, we're obviously in a Scandinavian uh, context right now, and there's a lot of good funding in, in the Nordic region. I got some money from the Danish Arts Council. It wasn't quite enough, so I had to send it back. Um, you can say you can say the project's canceled. You 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 can and you have to. Otherwise, they <laughs> will come after you. So I was just about how am I going to do this? Because I just don't. And w one thing is to not want advertising for political reasons or for critical reasons, but another thing is just how to sell an ad in 2020 or whenever I started. This game has changed as well a lot. Um, it's a, there are very few ad sellers left. And a lot of luxury brands have drifted more and more into the digital only. Um, there are several brands that, that have announced that over the next five years they're um, withdrawing print advertising entirely. Um, and if they do print, it's often old, old friendships or, or deals with places like Vogue. Of course, they will get their ads. But what I saw in, when I was working in commercial fashion publishing was that I worked for a magazine that had the, you know, the big ten brands at, in the the first ten pages, but I realized half of them wasn't they weren't paying, because but they just kept them in because it looked then it would look like they were paying for the other brands so they would pay because it looks really good to have Celine and then Chanel and then you know, so I kind of decided to to kind of completely stay away from that economy because I th it looked like from the outside that it was collapsing actually. Um, but then meanwhile, I, I, I work in the curatorial and I work with art institution and I started doing these exhibitions that cross art and fashion history and spending a lot of time in museums, spending a lot of time in galleries and saw that in the art world, there was a very keen interest on fashion in, in fashion topics. And meanwhile, a fashion world very interested in art association, let's call it. Um, and I kept, I was getting invited to do these shows and I was pitching museum shows um, in fashion exhibitions and art museums, essentially. And, and it was, I was much more successful with that. Um, and what I started doing was to kind of sneak in Visco's as a kind of catalog budget, like for the budget for the catalog, a very cheap catalog. Because art, art, art museums are, they, they often have to make catalogs, or they think they do, and they think it's very, very expensive. But I kind of would come around and say, well, for half, I can make a magazine, because I could also get some money from the Danish government and from the Nordic Arts Council, and sort of pots of money here and there. The world of fundraising, which is what art institutions and off spaces are, you know, they're in that business. We don't have luxury, well, some do, but um, a lot of, of working in art is one long grant application. And I think I'm better than that, at, at that than talking to luxury brands, actually. So there I was. Um, the first issue was entirely funded by Nordic grants. So thank you for welfare states. Uh, well, thank you to welfare states. And issue two was with an institution in Denmark. Issue three was with an institution in China. Issue four was with one in New York. Um, and it's more or less been how we've rolled ever since. Um, of course, now we make money by selling as well. We've upped our print, so there is a bit of money that comes in, and we, of course, use that for the next. Um, so yeah, I've kind of become a leech in the art world. Um, and it's somehow maybe more my people, so they understand what I'm saying when I'm trying to sell them this model. And um, because publishing is ultimately such a material process, as you say as well, Anya, to come in, I mean, that's not necessarily the specialty of an, of an art museum. Um, they were like, oh, we, run a, we want a really nice book, or we want a reader, but they don't know the designers, they don't know the printers, or even if they do, they don't know how to distribute it, which I think is a huge part of magazine making as well, is to have a network and getting these things out into the world, into stores. And that took a few years as well. <laughs> um, but once you've done that, you know, it's not so hard to sell a magazine, actually. Um, at least a certain amount of magazines, let's say. So that's the kind of, the more the nitty gritty. I still make PDFs for luxury brands for them to consider, because they pop up, you know, they like what we do. They think we're cool, we have a cool network. Um, 
and I'm I'm always open, <laughs> but it just it seems a little too esoteric. I think still um, for 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 some of these brands, and I think this is a part. I mean, very apropos this exhibition, art, luxury, fashion, who's that they take an interest in art because of its branding possibilities and its marketing possibilities. And they often want to make art programs. And you see now here in Bourse de Commerce and um, you know, luxury conglomerates also own the auction houses. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff happening in that convergence. Um, but if art is always treated, or niche projects, critical projects, are always treated as a form of marketing, um, at the same level as like giving money to an influencer or um, putting in an ad in a, in a magazine in Vogue, then it's going to be a really tough conversation. It needs to, pay, arts patronage needs to be dealt with in a different way, and um, it's that's a, that's a tough battle. And I think a lot of there's a lot of missed opportunities right now because there is a lot of money out there. Fashion has a lot of money for art stuff. But um, yeah, if it's all just in the end of the day a T-shirt that has to be sold, um, then it's it's a it's a tough call. That's a long answer. How about you? <laughs> I'm I really want to hear. I think your model is interesting. I know a, a little bit about it, and I I would I would love for you for you to put more words on it. I don't know that I have a model. <laughs> Please tell me what my model is. Well, you've been associated with academia. F more formally. That's um, true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think that's an important thing. Yeah. To know. So, and I've, um, I have funded Vestoy in all sorts of different ways over the years. Um, um, <laughs> I was going to say bar prostitution. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> no, but uh, no, but I, I've I've uh, I'm not good at uh, grant writing. I'm I'm uh, learning. Mm. That language, uh, because it is a language. Yeah. That that I think is uh, is a very good avenue uh, if you if you know how to position your your project or if it fits the boxes. But um, but I've uh, I've done Vestoy. Uh, I've paid for Vestoy through sponsorships at the beginning. I remember um, getting paper like the production costs covered by the paper company and the printer and. Most of the people who work uh, with me work as volunteers, so my uh, so the story relies very much on this um, uh, on the tried and tested method of free work in fashion. So that's um, you know that's something that um, on the one hand is problematic, and on the other hand is what we need to do in order for these kind of projects to exist. Um, so over the years, uh, you know, sometimes we've had uh, a budget. What for several years we worked, Vestoy was, um, I was a research fellow at University of the Arts in London. And as a research fellow, I had a research budget. And that budget went to the production of Vestoy. That meant that, um, there was budget for the making of the magazine, and also uh, I could figure out how to uh, compensate not all, but some of the contributors. Um, I've worked uh, and still work a lot with academics, and so I've tried to, um, because I, so <coughs> giving academics a space to write in, a, in this non-jargon laden, non-academic way for uh, a pub publication that reaches a different audience while an academic also needs to publish, if they are affiliated with an institution, publishing is an important part of the work. So that's been a way for me also to um, justify, I suppose, uh, giving something to the writer, not feeling bad about uh, that something not being money, but rather uh, ex you know, exposure or a chance to write in a different way, while also knowing that it's their job. Um, I have, at, I mean, I, I've never, I, my fundraising as I've done it has relied more on um, personal connections really. Like one time I met uh, 
uh, fashion entrepreneur who I convinced to put some money into an issue of a story that was fortunate. Another time, uh, I met another wealthy person who put some money into the story because she really loves it. Then uh, I've done some consulting over the years with Nike most recently. I've found a way to work, you know, different but somehow similar to what you're describing mm -hmm. in terms of your of uh, working with institutions and catalogs. For me, with a brand like Nike, it's had to, it's been uh, a matter of um, putting on an event, uh, consulting, and making it and um, putting a publication in with that, the publication is the story. You weren't, you weren't, curiously with what I've learned also, very interesting, like luxury fashion brands, luxury fashion brands, the ones that you see down Champs-Elysees, the French uh, ones, are uh, not necessarily so interested. Uh, I mean, they've been interested in the story in terms of giving access to this creative director or, or this other, but not in terms of uh, of um, putting money into it as a kind of cultural uh, means of cultural production, whereas mass like big companies like Nike, they have the uh, the I mean their positioning. They basically have to hit every single person all at once, like every consumer, you know, from the from the most. Uh, uh, like from, from the one that knows the least about fashion to the most sophisticated one. And so for a company like, like that one, and there are, there are others uh, like it, cultural production is important. And it's not a matter of, um, I give you this amount of money and you get um, you know, X, Y, Z in return. It's a lot more fluid than that. So I've learned also over the years how that kind of shadow economy uh, works. And I've learned how to parlay that into the work that I do um, and to making the story happen. Um, so it's, I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, it's not really a model as such because it's, it's much more um, improvised, I think, uh, when you uh, do a project uh, uh, that is, um, yeah, that is this kind of creative uh, self-expression type project that that um, our magazines, I think, both are. Mm. You have to think of on your feet, and you have to you, you learn how to be an opportunist as well. That's very important. If you meet somebody or see a, an opening, like how how can I turn that into something yeah. useful? Yeah, being really cheeky and being very clever, I think, is, is definitely the key. And to think in unconventional ways. And, I mean, we have the weirdest kind of, whether it's a cultural aff affinity to, a, to something or it's a personal one, you know, they're, they're, it's, these are imp this is important cultural production. I really do think so, and I think many people do think so. Um, and the economies around them, I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about this and this the, the economy of consulting the, and the relationship between niche luxury and mass market and the way it plays out. Um, I think there is a new interest in niche, especially in the kind of ubiquity of mass media, TikTok kind of world where everything is available. I think a lot of young consumers are drifting towards hyper curated, very tasteful kind of niche things. Um, and and it's interesting to see how these big, big, big economies are shifting in, in relation to that. Um, and I'm sure over the last 14 years, you've also seen these waves come and go. And um, commercial fashion publishing has also changed. Um, there were, a, I remember a time when there were lots of magazines that were focused on industry talk like some places like System, for example, like they're sort of intellectually driven magazines. Um, but then it, these waves change as well. And I think, yeah, improvising in relation to the contemporary context one is in is, is, is really important um, for these things to even, yeah, um, exist. I wonder, in fact, um, if because we were such a small group today, I wonder if maybe you guys have questions that you would like to ask us. Um, perhaps there are things we haven't covered, or, or perhaps you're thinking also about um, how to 
make uh, a project of your own happen and what you might need in order to do that. Um. <coughs> It's always hard to be the first one. To <laughs> usually at talks, I, did, I couldn't do it today because I, I don't know any of you guys, but usually I plant a question in the audience. Oh, that's like, tell a friend, ask me this, and then it gets easier afterwards. I have one. I'll start. <laughs> now, it was interesting what you were saying about um, how you changed through life, that you used to be more renegade and a rebel, and there's a, a critique, and there is a critique in, in what you're writing. And I was also wondering if... Um, if I know it's a very 70s word, but if there's a sort of activism in what you're doing, if that's an interest, because um, I, I'm presuming maybe I'm not, but th that you, with your magazines, two magazines, are writing to an audience that are already converted, you know, they already agree with you. Please come here. Um, in Denmark and probably in many places, but for example, the Copenhagen Fashion Week is very... Uh, occupied with sustainable fashion, which is one of those big questions in the f in the world, climate change, but also in in the fashion world. Um, how do we deal with this industry that is so contrary to the to an ideal of of sustainability? So that was just one example. It could be anything. But do you, is do you have this sense of activism or wanting to change things in being able to write critique fashion magazines? <coughs> I would uh, it's yes and no um, I think uh, when f for me the what I would like to change is at an uh, you know attitudes more than you know ways of doing things I've, I've um, certainly felt um, that it was always more um effective to you know to be on the inside and to whisper on the inside rather than be on the outside shouting and it's a better way to get heard i think if you're not in opposition to the person that you're or, or the person or people or company or what have, what have you that you're talking to oftentimes um i have um thought that because i've um having this in between our position between academia and, and industry, I've um, been many times at uh, academic conferences over the years, and I've always been struck by the um, uh, <laughs> the that the criticism that comes from uh, from scholars often seems to fall on deaf ears because the people they are criticizing they are not uh, there, they're not at the conference, they're not. Um, hearing what what's being said, or if they are there, the language is um, is too confrontational. And you know, like when someone is uh, accusing you of something, you get defensive. And if you're defensive, it's very hard to take on board what's being said. And so, um, I uh, Vestoy has um, has and is a, a, a critical voice, uh, but it's not. It's not critical in the sense of uh, being um, of saying you're doing it wrong. It's more. Uh, it's critical more in terms of um, encouraging um, critical thought or or uh, or encouraging you to, as a reader, to think for yourself rather than to take, um, you know, to swallow uh, hook, line, and sink or whatever you're being uh, fed, including you know by Vestoy mm. and. Uh, and so, um, I am not so much, I'm, I'm not really interested in, um, in um, saying or, you know, pointing out who does it well, uh, you know, who does it better and who does it worse. I'm much more interested in, in just understanding uh, the motivations, what, what drives an individual or a company to behave the way that they do. Um, and so my, that's what I was referring to when I was talking earlier about um, empathy or, or about wanting to understand or wanting to, uh, to, yeah, to understand what, uh, what motivates you, you know, like because at different 
different points in one's life, you're motivated by different uh, by different things. And I haven't wanted, I've wanted to withhold my judgment really uh, in talking to someone who works for a big company or in talking to someone who uh, operates as an independent actor. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's the story is much, it, it's not about being on the barricades. Um, even at, uh, Even when I saw myself as a, uh, as a rebel, it wasn't really about being on the barricades so much in, in terms of the publication. It was more about um, encouraging the reader to ask questions. I would say Viscos is very much on the barricades, but in the historical Marxist sense. <laughs> um, fashion... Well, I think to your question, the, the short answer is there is a difference between critique and activism. Um, criticality, critical thinking, thinking for yourself is the first step. And um, there's so much work to be done in cultural production in general, but especially in fashion. Why? Because fashion is the art of consumerism. And it operates within uh, a consumer capitalist economy that is ferocious and uh, merciless and um, profit-driven. And also co-ops and commodifies everything, including activism. Um, climate change is also advertised in H&M today. So I think what critical thinking offers and what critique offers is to understand how these mechanics, as you say, how things work. How is the machine put together? And what are the, the different bolts and knots of the, of the machine? Um, I guess the activist hope is some kind of distant thing of like, well, if someone reads this, there's a kind of consciousness that is raised and that is something they'll take with them in their work lives and in their industries. We also, we're not anti-industry by any means. We, we hope that the people that read these magazines are fashion people um, so that things like corporations and um, exploitation in the fashion system, which is so pervasive, um, could change for the better. But to go there, you have to understand how fashion works. And we don't think enough about that, I think. Um, I mean, there's this was probably our most activist issue about um, trans, where we work with two trans um, art and fashion historians about um, transness in fashion in a kind of, pun intended, a trans historical way. Um, and and of course, the first thing we talked about, we discovered or bumped into was trans visibility and the trans tipping point that has been a kind of uh, a topic in pop culture that sometime after uh, 2018, um, transness became much more visible in, in popular culture and in fashion culture, and that's a good thing because more visibility and more representation is a good thing for minorities. This a very similar argument extends to ethnic minorities and to other queer people. Uh, this issue is really about uncovering the down, the, 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 the other side of that argument, that visibility also is not always a good thing and that um, representation in a hyper-commodified space of consumption can sometimes be counter um, productive or go against the mission, let's say, if there is one. Um, so rather than saying point fingers and go over here, it's more to understand the intense ambivalence of fashion that fashion is. You know, it's a system we're all a part of. It's incredibly violent and um, exploitative and materially disastrous. At the same time, it is a form of self-expression. It is a huge sense of joy. It's a form of aesthetics that it, you know, makes life better. So, and I think this is why fashion is so wonderful as a space of thinking, because it's, it's very symptomatic of what it means to live in this world. Art you know, has the blinders on and thinks it operates in this autonomous other space of um, of politics and critical freedom and whatever autonomy, which of course it doesn't. Art is just as implicated in bad economics as fashion is, just in a kind of different way. But fashion, I think, is we're able to talk about ambivalence and hold ambivalence in fashion, and this is why I still deal with fashion in my work, 
because I think it gives us the tools um, to deconstruct complicated things um, such as sustainability, which is like, where do you start? I mean, um, it's not an enough to talk, say if the cotton is organic or not. You know, that's a kind of a, that's a really short sell. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Criti this, this talk is called critical publishing, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and criticality, I think, is is probably the important answer there, yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Um, I was just wondering a bit more about your process when creating an issue, like how does the idea start? How much is it done by like an in-house team? How do you reach out to artists or other people? And it's like how much time does it take up of your uh, jobs when also doing other things? So, yeah. Um, should I go first? I, as I said, I'm a curator. So I think I approach um, editing very curatorially. Um, it's all sort of an exhibition in my head or like there are these different things. And I think similarly to Vestoy, what we definitely share is that these formats are very, usual fashion publishing has like a fr front of magazine and a back of magazine and interview section and a, I don't see that there's, I think there's a lot of freedom in both of our magazines to say, if this is a personal essay, it's a personal essay. Or if this is a, you know, if this is poetry, then it's poetry. And maybe it's one page, maybe it's 15 pages. Um, so that, at least for, for me, gives an incredible freedom to drift around a certain topic, sometimes for years. Um, and say, oh, there's that project, and this history, maybe, or I discovered this archive, or... So it's kind of just like building a very long list of things. And then at one point, if there is a context or an opportunity or it feels right, to sort of like, okay, let's actually build this out. Let's look more aggressively for or more purposely for the specialists. So, you know, who knows something about this topic? Who knows something about retail? Who knows something about trans fashion history? It's actually not that many people. Finding the academic. Um, in Visco, in Vesco, Visco, <laughs> we should just join. <laughs> in Visco's, we we also recommission or we reprint a lot of archival material because so much is lost, and there was so much good stuff out there, even like five years ago, that has been forgotten. Um, I also work. I'm doing my PhD. I work as an art critic, and I do exhibitions and a bunch of other things. So it is a very difficult balance but I which is why also and I want it to be the most the best and most precise every time so I often work with co-editors who are specialists in the in the field or in the f field that we want to cover so here we worked with a fashion historian from the UK and an art historian from the US um, retail I had been interested in retail art historically how artists were using fashion retail for exhibitions and then I met someone, a cu another curator, who Camilla Palomino, who had just had been doing a lot of work on the World Trade Center Mall. That um, a lot of people don't know, but under the World Trade Center was the biggest mall in Manhattan. Um, and she had been doing like years research for that for five years, and knew all these people who had done artist residencies there. And there was a whole kind of portfolio of projects. And I was, I was like, come with me, and. Um, so yeah, it's also networking and team building. And um, it's a really fun process. I think as you say, it's a very self-rewarding, very selfish project because it's a way of doing a lot of research very fast. You get really like thrown into all these different, like we're now doing an issue on perfume and it's like the nerds that I'm talking to I mean, it's the things I hadn't, I know, I would never find out. I would never get to know all of these things, but you find someone who's run a blog for 15 years, written, writing about perfumes. It's incredible. I mean, it's such a privilege to then be like, can you write an article um, and we can pay you for it? So, yeah. Um, for me, the... Um the time I spent has has um, oscillated a lot over the years. While I was a uh, research fellow, that was what I did all day, every day. Um, and so I usually, um, my process is first, got to come up with the theme. And the theme is often 
in some way a reaction to the previous theme, like a, a, a kind of opposite direction um, kind of thing. I, I think I did, for instance, um, an issue on failure, then I did another one on authenticity, then I did another one on capital. Somehow, like these themes, at least in my mind, um, are, re are reactions to one another. So it, it allows me to go into um, a field of research that I don't already know. Um, I, uh, for me, it's been always very important to have a, a, a very clear idea of what I want uh, the issue to be like, the, the themes within the theme that I want covered. And so I need to know a lot about the topic myself um, before I contact potential uh, writers. Um, <coughs> and I, my uh, MO typically has been to invite writers who already know about the topic, but not the exact angle that I'm interested in. And so I find out about the work that they do, and then I propose that they uh, contribute an article that relies on the knowledge they already have, but that gives them an interesting new avenue to explore that um, their own work through, let's say. Um, since Vestoy is annual, I typically spend uh, probably seven months or so working on the on the topic, just like, but uh, alongside doing, you know, doing life, doing life, and uh, and um, at times work for clients or you know whatever it is that. Um, one must do. <laughs> one has to do, yeah, uh, to pay the bills. But um, but the f the the uh, the thing really is that once, like, for me, once I get into a topic, it just kind of takes me over, and so I start and uh, everything I start thinking about through this lens, and so I have conversations with friends and colleagues about whatever theme uh, it is that I'm working on, like everything becomes colored by it. So the work itself is is not just the work in front of the computer or in the archive or, or, or you know, me and the topic, but it, it, it becomes, it comes alive in the world because um, through conversation, through conversation, casual conversation, you know, and a lot of my ideas uh, come through those casual conversations. You know the, you know the the, um, uh, you know how ideas sometimes come when you're in the shower or when you're doing the dishes or you know, for me allowing uh, my work to to take time, um, publishing yearly is unusual in fashion, mm -hmm. and and s but uh, I knew from the get go that having a slow process would allow me to be uh, first to, to have the time to allow a, uh, a topic to mature and to get to those random connections that just come when you end up having a casual conversation with someone who mentions a take on uh, that you hadn't considered or a person that you didn't know about and suddenly your work goes in a new direction. Um, but also the time to, um, to make the 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 book happen uh, properly, not to have to stress too much about where the money is coming from, because I have time to uh, to uh, look for it, or to or I have time to do other work at the same time as I'm developing an issue of Vestoy. So, uh, and also it has placed Vestoy um, parallel to the. Um, advertising model that other that uh, otherwise uh, magazines tend to rely on since those uh, that model is has gone you know from monthly to biannual relying on the fashion calendar but by publishing annually i don't i don't need to stress about really when uh, the story is going to come out it doesn't need to uh, fall uh, at any particular time during the year in order to um, I don't know, whatever products are being, you know, um, pushed in the magazine uh, have, you know, I, in that sense, uh, the story is m meant more as a, uh, as a um, reference book, something that you can uh, return to again and again in your own work, whatever it is that you happen to do, something that 
should be saved and put on your bookshelf and then rediscovered a few years later and reread and thought of in a different way. Um. First of all, thank you. It's like uh, you are you going to the true topics who are very like interested in as a young creative. Um, I'm like between this like apprehension of the industry and how you can find a way to be authentic and yourself and at the same time having like working in it you know and and making the, like your life but um yeah so it's thank you so much and i want i wanted to ask uh if you have any advice to found this balance because personally i'm like go into um finding the true essence of creative so like finding like stimulating creative by discussion and, and meeting people in a certain way and do you have any advice to make it your life happen with that <laughs> balance I it's so know. important that you do it first of all. i'll fight for it <laughs> i think i mean generally independence i think i mean we're maybe bad example or good examples or bad examples that like independent is the way but total independence is also a fiction. Like one must work and one must live and we all work for the man in a way. And um, contradiction is not a bad thing. It makes you think. And uh, some of the smartest people I know in the world are working in corporate fashion and they know exactly what value they're producing and how they're being exploited by stockholders or whatever. Um, so I'd, I think, I mean, this is also what Vesto and Viscos does. It's like they address people like they're in, so like they're smart. Like people aren't dumb. Fashion people aren't dumb. Um, speak up to people. But I think in terms of you charting um, your future, a great advice I got once was stay with your peers. And I was someone who was like, I had I was like very busy chasing after people a, a generation older than me because I thought what they were doing were really cool. I was interning for a Dis magazine when I was like 18, 19. I don't know if anyone remembers Dis, but I was like, everything they do is just incredible. But things really crystallized when I realized I looked around with my friends and my people and I started working with them and collaborating with them. And that has just been incredible to grow together and nourish these independent spaces together. Um, it's very important that you look around who's around you and that you help each other out, whether it's in publications or magazines or spaces or performance or whatever it is you want to do. Um, another thing is, I think not everything has to last forever. And I, this is also speaking as an art historian, is like the best projects are those that stop. Um, so even if it's something that's for six months or for one year, first you learn a lot, and if it goes really badly, <laughs> it can end. Um, but also sometimes the coolest thing is a capsule of t in time. Um, I'm writing my PhD about a certain Christmas markets that happened between 1981 and 1985. Uh, very much young people who didn't have any money and access to the art world. So they had these Christmas markets. I mean, it's like, it's such a small little thing, but in the way it says so much about, um, it was such an important project. So I would say that time and and your friends. I think I, um, time, um, I think of in terms of, yeah, giving yourself time, you know, in that <coughs> uh, if you, uh, if you go into a creative industry, you do need the time to develop, I mean, to find your voice, certainly, um, to know what you want to say, uh, to find your people, uh, to find your space. Um, I have a much more prosaic kind of advice, which is um, to live really cheap. That's always worked very well for me. Pay little in rent, don't go out too much. You know, uh, save your money. Don't spend because you see your friend spending. You know, like, the, um, no, honestly, it's like you. I think that. Um, I think it's it's very easy when you're working in a creative industry that relies so much on social networking to think that you got to be out all the time. You got to go out for dinner. You have to go and you know, 
for drinks, blah, blah, blah. No, invite people to your house, cook dinner at home, you know, and have the, the cheap wine, not the expensive one. You know, like, I, I think these, uh, uh, saving the pennies has been very useful for me. Um, and it's meant that, because um, I, I thought early on, like, you know, I don't, um, I, I also thought, okay, never want to spend my own money. I, I'm not going to do a vestoy from my savings. I'm going to wait until I can find someone or somewhere to pay for it. Um, if I don't have the money, I wait until I do. I don't want to, you know, I, I never want to live over my means. I don't want to stress about, can I pay the rent the next month? I want to always make sure that I can. And so then the other things have to wait. You know, if I want something and I can't uh, afford it, then I don't get it. Like, so I, I think it's just, um, it's, um, you know, the, the the more esoteric advice um, is really important, but the, you know how you live your everyday life um, is probably what will make or break you in the long term. It's a very Scandinavian talk you're at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on that note, um, if you want to give us some money, you can now <laughs> buy our magazines yes. um, at a very uh, advantageous rate way cheaper than in the shops. And of course, you know that, oh, I don't really know how we do it. I can see that there's a machine here that uh, hopefully means you can pay with cards. But uh, we both brought a few, and I, at least for me, I dropped my like bag of magazines twice on the way here when it was on, and I do not want to go home with them. So please help me out, <laughs> buy the magazine, and uh, I will have a much nicer cycle of ride home. Um, Mine, I don't know, Vestoy in the shop sells for 35. So I would give it to you guys for 25 today. And I don't know what Visco is. 27. Yeah. There you go. Vestoy is cheaper. <laughs> Buy Vestoy. <laughs> okay. Yes, of We're course. Here. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. So, yes, please stay around, have a drink, buy your magazines. <laughs>